Havana, 1943. Cuba has been independent for 40 years, 40 years during which America has replaced Spain in its protector's role. In Europe, far away from here, war is raging furiously. That year, a young man quite different from others lives in Havana. It's been two years since he left his native village to come here. He's 17 years old. He's an illegitimate child. Since he was born, he's been carrying his mother's name, Ruth, and concealing his father's name. In 1943, actually, his father separates from his official wife. For the register office, Ruth then becomes Castro Fidel Castro. He was born a second time. Fidel Castro goes to the Jesuits high school. When this decisive transformation occurs, he goes to Bellum High School where Father Lorente, now living in exile in Miami, was his mentor, his confessor, and his confidant. This kid was illegitimate. In our Spanish culture, it's badly seen. It's like a stain in his life, which has always obsessed him. That's why he felt obliged to achieve great deeds, almost in a pathological way, to overcome this original sin. This story begins here, in the south of Cuba, in Biran, in 1926, when Fidel was born from a relationship between Angel, the master of the domain, and a maid, with whom he already had two children. An illegitimate child indeed. But what counts first of all in his small childhood is that he's the master's son, heir apparent to a kingdom on which Angel, a wealthy colonist, rules over its people by fear and without any sharing. Beran's post office belongs to Angel. The only bank business of the village belongs to Angel. Beran's railroad belongs to Angel. The 11,000 hectares of sugarcane only belong to Angel only. As to the hundreds of Haitian farmers working on the domain, they are his thing. They are his skivvies like at the time of colonies. But the golden age has an end. At the age of four years and a half, the paradise of Fidel Ruz collapses when Angel's legitimate wife comes back to the village. Angel, who fears a scandal, gets rid of the children. Fidel Ruz, accompanied by his sister and his elder brother, then unceremoniously finds himself without consideration on a train station platform. Destination, Santiago de Cuba, and a few years later, Havana. When Fidel Ruz arrives in Havana, he's 15 years old and does not know anyone. In Belem High School, the most renowned school of the island, he competes with the sons of wealthy Cuban families who go to the Jesuits to get a master's education. Fidel had no sense of humor. I never heard him telling a joke. I never saw him with a fiancé during his youth. He would not party. He was invited, but he turned it down. Always, he preferred staying alone to read and study. Fidel was the exact opposite of a real Cuban. He was a Spanish, through and through. His education and his way of thinking belonged to the Galician type. But Fidel Ruz especially excels in sports activities, and he ends up finding his place. His success at the high school diploma and the acknowledgement of his father who gives him his name crowns it all. At the age of 18, Fidel Castro seems having found a family. University of Havana, another world, another family. Fidel Castro signs up for law school, but very soon he skips class for political forums, which take place at the top of the monumental staircase. It's actually much more useful when one wants to build himself a reputation. Yet, to enter the gang, one must be cunning, because here, politics look like a bloody battlefield, where rival gangs settle their arguments in the following way. 
Unfortunately, it was a time when it was believed on campus that it didn't cause any problem to kill someone. We took part in attacks. We thought that murdering for political reasons, of course not for no reason or for any other reasons, but only for political reasons was a legitimate act. On this rather left-wing campus, Fidel Castro is quickly perceived as a son of colonists and a typical example of conservative and pro-Franco Jesuit schools. The gap is so obvious that he inspires mistrust straight off. When they organized an attack, they took him along to get him involved. This is how he joined the gangsters. Fidel made friends with them to be accepted. It thus gave him a sort of title in college. In order to test his beliefs, Fidel is ordered to murder the leader of a rival gang, the UIR, a group known for its anti-communist activities. But the business turns sour. He wounds his target instead of killing it. Threatened of death, Fidel is then caught in the spiral. He hides out, and to get through, he offers his enemies of yesterday to become their friend. He thus enters at the UIR. It's difficult to grasp Castro's political beliefs. Soon after, he actually joins his friend Ovaris, who runs the most important student's organization. A few months later, he demonstrates with the Orthodox Party, which militates for the establishment of a democratic regime in Cuba. Fidel is smiling and he is serene. On the newspapers of that time, we can see the first public pictures of Castro. He is the only one wearing a double-breasted suit and a tie. He has just made a political marketing success by taking back to Havana a bell symbolizing the struggle against the Spanish colonist. Yet his recent past is chasing him because he's suspected of having murdered a friend of Avaris. I can easily talk to you about the thousands of murders perpetrated by Fidel. But this was not his deed, he had nothing to do with that. And this is when he asked for my help through a mutual friend. He actually asked me to help him leave the country and to take him along with me during a student's conference which had to take place in Colombia. When Fidel and Novares arrive in Bogota in 1949, Gaetan, the leader of the Colombian left, is murdered, so Bogota flares up. Five days of unprecedented riots. Fidel no longer discovers the power of gangs, but the efficiency of the armed struggle. It was unbelievable. It seemed like the city had undergone a bombardment. I've never seen such a thing. In the afternoon, Fidel joins us where we were staying, and he starts talking nonsense about the coup in Bogota, trying to justify the revolt, and he starts talking about revolution. Having left Cuba in a mad rush, Castro comes back as a hero. He gives a press meeting, and before an astounded Ovaris, he claims his predominant role in the events of Bogota. Then for a while at least, he disappears. He marries Merta Diaz Ballard, born into an important family related to the clan of Batista, the former president of Cuba, who started a new career in business. Batista very kindly deposits a thousand dollars in the wedding presents of the married couple. Then Castro rushes into his studies, and four months later, he gets his lawyer's degree. This is when he discovers the works of Marx, Lenin, and Engels, but he keeps his favors for the Orthodox party. In 1952, he even stands for election under this label in the district of Havana. He did an excellent election campaign. According to polls, if the elections had taken place, I think he should have been elected to parliament in last position. The elections will not take place, since Batista, who returned in politics, stands for election and asks for a meeting with Castro. It is Fidel's brother-in-law who organizes the meeting in Kukin, in the very home of Batista. Batista, if you go back in politics, would you like to become attorney general? Fidel, no, and if you make the coup d'etat, you will find me facing you. 
March 10, 1952. Batista disregards him and starts the coup. Between the two men, war is now declared. July 1953, Fidel takes the road to Santiago. In the small group following him, only five men are led into the secret. Among them is Raul Castro, his younger brother, a member of the communist youth. July 26, in the early hours, Fidel, surrounded by approximately 180 men, launches an attack on the 10,000 men of the garrison of Moncada. Very quickly, the coup turns into a rout. The insurgents are massacred. Judged on the spot, Fidel takes up his own defense. He obtains the release of 43 accomplices. Then he finishes his defense with this megalomaniac phrase, history will absolve me. So, is Moncada a military fiasco? This is not what Cubans who want things to change remember at the time. What they first remember is the challenge taken against Batista and the will to put an end to this exceptional regime generated by the coup. Isla del Pino, the island of pine trees. The Moncada rebels are transferred to this island. But as we say, it's a three-star prison. Fidel even writes to his friends that sometimes he feels like being at the beach. However, prison, as often, very quickly proves to be a school for the revolution. He listened to the radio and he read all the dailies. Everybody sent him books on Napoleon, Lenin, and Marx. Once, they confiscated a book on Stalin, written by Trotsky. He spoke to the manager of the prison to protest. It is bad manners to confiscate an anti-communist book because it was written by Trotsky, Stalin's enemy. When he writes to me, he talks about democracy and he quotes the democratic heroes. But when he writes to his lover, Nati Revuelta, he talks about Lenin and Karl Marx. Fidel tells everybody what they want to hear. Batista, courted by the Diaz Balart, the family of Fidel's wife, then ends up being generous. He pardons Fidel after two years. The day of his release, the press is awaiting him. He's the only one who's not carrying any luggage. Many small signs which cannot fool anyone. Fidel is the boss. He disregards Batista's mercy and pins him down. He creates the movement of July 26, demands free elections and accuses Batista of being a thief and a murderer. Forced to flee, Fidel then declares it's the kind of journey from where one comes back as a marcher or as a hero. In Mexico, where he finds shelter, Fidel very quickly has an important encounter. He meets Ernesto Che Guevara. Between Fidel the activist and the Che the ideologist, the chemistry immediately operates. Carlos Franchi, an intellectual who went part of the way with them, recalls the meeting. The Che was reading The Foundations of Leninism by Stalin. So I asked him why he was reading this book and if he knew who Stalin was. He told me he knew and that he was a Stalinist himself. I asked him if he had read Khrushchev's report. He told me that what Khrushchev was saying on Stalin was only a stack of imperialist lies. He didn't believe in it. Fidel was listening speechless. The only intervention he made was to conclude that in a revolution, he said, it's better having a nasty leader than several kind leaders. Around Fidel, the small troop following him established a training camp. The aim is to prepare for the landing in Cuba. In November 1956, the small troop is ready, but Frank Pais, one of the leaders of the M26, expresses some reservations. He thinks that the coup is premature, militarily speaking, and he comes up against Castro, but Castro disregards him. On the 24, the grandma, providing for 25 people gets underway with 82 men on board. On the 30, as planned, Frank Pais takes over Santiago. Delayed by the storm, the grandma is long in coming. 
It shows up two days later in a wild creek, two days later in Santiago. The men of Pais must retreat by order. Without the heavy artillery which stayed on board, Fidel and his men then sink into the Sierra Maestra. Barely 10 days after the landing, there are only 16 men left over 82. But this time for Fidel, this new military fiasco has a political cost. Thanks to the events of November 30, Frank Pais went ahead of Fidel in the movement's organization chart. In a letter addressed to Fidel, he describes the reorganization in each branch and in each section of the movement, and he announces the creation of a national management. But Fidel is not part of it. Challenged by his followers, hunted by Batista's troops, Fidel has only one trump card left, himself and his gift for communication. Everybody believes he's dead, even Batista thinks so. Fidel doesn't deny the rumor, he is biding his time. And 15 days later, at Christmas, he resurrects. He's wearing a cross, a beard, and slips that there are 12 plus 1, like the Apostles. This is when Benino joins Fidel. He's 17 years old. Era un ídolo indiscutible. He certainly Para was an me, idol. For me, Fidel was the man of fuerza, truth, strength, dignity, coraje. and courage. I could see all of that in Fidel. If I say something else, I will be lying. On February 17, 1957, Herbert Matthews, chief reporter at the New York Times, visits the Sierra. During the interview, Fidel is constantly interrupted by his lieutenants, who come to inform him of the movements of columns on the front line. Eventually, Matthews is convinced that he's in the headquarters of a real army. The stratagem worked well. Others will be misled. All the people of the Sierra Maestra are with, with us. Hundreds of men are watching the enemy movement day and night. We always know where he is, but he never knows where we are. In Santiago, Pais widens the gap over fundamental issues. He wins the trust of the American consul, obtains arms, and promises, in case of victory, the restoration of the Constitution of 1940 and voting rights. In a letter, Franks writes to Fidel that the movement does not have any political platform and that the militants question its capability of leading the country towards democracy. I agreed with Frank Pais and with others when they gave their views on the difference between the leader and the Codillo. This distinction really annoyed Fidel, and Fidel disagreed. If you have any suggestions to make to complete this project, writes Pais, please let me know. And he adds, the board of the revolutionary movement resides in Santiago de Cuba. It is entirely in the hands of Buenvenido and in my hands. Celia Sanchez is appointed delegate to the Sierra. On July 30, 1957, Batista's police force puts an end to the trial of strength between the two men. They eliminate Pais, and Fidel no longer has any rival. And the Democrats become short of any influence spokesman within the movement. In the Sierra, two men then impose themselves very quickly beside Castro. Camilo Cienfuegos first, the Cuban, this young man laughing on all the photos, a real loving face who joined Fidel in Mexico. He organizes the most spectacular stratagems against Batista's troops. And there is also the Che. I joined the guerrilla thanks to the action and thought of our venerated leader, Fidel Castro. Contrary to Pais, both commanders are inclined to action rather than politics, but another event will confirm this political change within the M26. This is Radio Rebelde. Our brave guerrilla fighters fight under the orders of our leader Fidel Castro. 
Carlos Franchi creates Radio Rebelde, the radio of clandestine propaganda. It allows Castro to speak directly to the Cuban people. Usted no encontrará en la historia de la insurrección parte del Che Guevara, ni de Camilo, ni de los partes de los Cial. One day a militant arrived in Havana with a document which suggested to change the name of the M26 to call it the Fidelist Movement. Fidel was in seventh heaven. He showed me the document and I couldn't get over it, so I told him, how can you accept this? How many Barbudos are rallying around Fidel? A hundred, two hundred, three hundred, barely more. Surely not enough to talk about a popular support. Castro is no more than a group leader, not a claimant to sovereignty. But the circumstances will change the deal. First, there is the state of void in the countryside, where Fidel's generous and peremptory speech hits the bullseye. And especially, there is the general strike decided by the M26 in April 1958. The population does not follow. It's a resounding setback. This allowed Fidel Castro for the military intervention in the city's movements. And from that moment, the balance was unset. Fidel takes on alone the management from the Sierra. Ten days after the check, Fidel who had also publicly called to the general strike, disowns the city's leaders. He expels three representatives of the M26, three Democrats, as by a matter of chance. At the same moment, the American press publishes photos of the tortured Cuban students. America, shocked by the pictures, declares an embargo on arms to Cuba. This is when Huber Matos, a young teacher, lands in risky conditions in the heart of the Sierra. The airplane contains five tons of arms and ammunition. Fidel was jumping for joy like a kid. Then he started testing all kinds of arms and fired bursts in every direction. And he said, with these weapons now, we will certainly win the war. He was crazy like a child in front of Christmas gifts. In this month of April 1958, chance turns in favor of the Barbudos. Three months later, in August, Castro splits the island in two, sends the columns led by the Che and Camilo to the north, and the column of Matos towards Santiago. But Batista's troops refuse the confrontation. What's the use of defending the regime when Americans seem to have taken sides? At this time, Father Lorente, his Jesuit mentor from Belém, goes up to the Sierra. When I meet the first militia, the first militiaman who we run into tells me, don't be afraid, we cannot shoot you, we don't have any bullets to load our rifles. They had some cartridges to shoot birds down, but these were their only weapons. This was the advance guard. The poor fellows were very nice and naive. Fidel slept with his rifle in a hammock. And this was his headquarter. And I asked him, what do you want to do with this army of scoundrels? He replied, the important thing is not for my army to be powerful, but it is for the people to believe it. Father went up to the Sierra on the request of the Vatican, which was anxious to know at the time whether this revolution was communist, Christian or patriotic. Like many others, he will come back empty-handed on that point. So is Fidel already a communist at the time? Probably not. Does he already know that he will side with the communists to seize power? It's difficult to say. Even if he treats the Democrats tactfully and signs an agreement with the former presidents in exile who used their power before the return of Batista, what is certain is that he coaxes the communists. This is what notices Manuel Rey, one of the managers of the city's movement in December 1958. When the Che arrived in villages, he didn't ask to meet those who resisted under the banner of the M26, but he rather met the members of the Communist Party. 
He would entrust these ones with responsibilities in the liberated areas. So it aroused my suspicions and I noticed Fidel. And he replied, don't worry, I'm immediately sending a letter to the Che to tell him to stop. But I saw the letter and it was rather soft. Facing danger, Americans leave Batista alone. In consequence, entire regions follow without fighting. So to avoid Castro's victory, Americans make a last attempt and support a coup by the army. But it's too late. On the 20, Matos takes the suburbs of Santiago. On the 25, the Che is at the gates of Santa Clara. On the 1st of January, in Santiago de Cuba, Castro enthrones the future president Urrutia. Then he calmly declares, without turning a hair, I'm not interested by power. As we are taking over the entire country and we are controlling all the armed forces thanks to the revolutionary command that I'm running, I'm therefore subordinated to the orders of the new president, Urrutia. Meanwhile, in Havana, panic took hold of the city. On January 1st, Batista leaves the country in a mad rush. On the 3rd, Camillo besieges the stronghold of Colombia, and the Che takes without fighting the stronghold of Cabana. Fidel decides to take the road to accomplish a thousand kilometers from Santiago to Havana, a victorious march, a rise to glory that he's gulping down tastefully. He goes on a walkabout alone in cities liberated by Matos, the Che or Camillo. But contrary to these commanders clashing swords behind the scenes, He's definitely present, like here in Camagüey, where he already keeps the people waiting. Naturally, you can understand our desire to quickly arrive in Havana, among other places, because we know that the people are expecting us. But as you could see, the march must go slowly. In Havana, on the 8, everything is ready for coronation. And when Fidel appears suddenly on the roof of an armored car, the people of the capital is at his feet. Does he remember then of his prophecy, history will absolve me, thrown at the face of the judges after the disaster of the Moncada? Does he recall the miserable sailing of the grandma, which three years ago threw overboard a routed troop on a hostile shore? While an entire people is acclaiming him as the father of the nation, can he measure the distance covered by Angel's son, who had to wait for 17 years to call himself Castro? For the first time, we discover a beaming Castro, laughing heartily and evading the severe memory of his Jesuit years. The beautiful day will last into late night through a speech appearing like a sermon in the stronghold of Colombia, conquered by Camillo. Even doves are of the party, doves operated by a pigeon fancier who conducts the ballet of white birds, an image of peace which leaves a strong impression on the small people of Havana, to who Castro swears, his hand on his heart, that he is the democratic sort. Later he will strike the same chord when he will be interviewed on the future of the M26. Will be organized by their leaders as a political party because it is the only way. As a political party? Yes, of course. And it is the only way uh, in a democracy uh, for, uh, for, for the political activity. Yet, behind the conventional talk, a usual trick of revolutions is very quickly hanging in the balance. Arbitrary arrests, speedy trials, public executions. On January 14, the death penalty is restored. On the 21, a crowd electrified by Castro supports the punishment for war criminals. The next day, the spectacle of death live starts afresh, and suddenly, nothing. Or rather, 
no evidence of the ferocious repression conducted by his brother Raoul and by the Che. Castro understood the disastrous impact of these pictures on the public opinion and very quickly bans any kind of publicity. From this moment, pictures will become rare or then will be sanitized by the propaganda which entrusts Roman Carmen, a famous Soviet documentary director with the care of filming a history made to measure. Fidel feels indisposed by the popularity of the government established by the new president, so he gets appointed as prime minister and he organizes behind the scenes a shadow government made of his close guard and communists. El problema, the problem is that I and 90% of the rebel army, we didn't know the communists. Almost everybody in the management of the communist party was an intellectual. And in this way, they could infiltrate and monopolize the key positions of the government's management and everything. It's the same scenario for the intelligence department. Alfredo Feyas, who has been following Camillo since the Sierra and who very quickly becomes integrated into the new departments, witnesses the arrival of newcomers. And who trained you? The Russians? Immediately? The best elements were sent to the KGB in Moscow for an intensive training. In this context, how must we interpret this interview given by Fidel to CBS? As everyone in Cuba calls him, has been away in the hill country, where he made his home for two years. A few hours ago, he returned to his apartment on the 23rd floor of the Havana Hilton Hotel in the center of the city, just a short distance from the presidential palace. Good evening, Fidel Castro. Fidel, I'm told that you saw your mother for the first time in four years this Christmas Eve. That must have been quite a reunion. What did she have to say to you? She began to cry at the beginning and at the end, several minutes. She could not tell any word to me. Well, I'm sure she must have asked about her grandson. Wasn't Fidelito supposed to be with us tonight? Yes, yes. You want? Fidelito. <laughs> Hello, Fidel Jr. Hi. Fidelito, have you heard from any of your friends at school here in New York? Yes. I got a book here from some of my friends. A book of letters? Yes. Well, now, wh what did they say? To Fidel Castro Jr. from his class at Pier 20 Queens, New York, USA. Oh, wonderful. A lot of letters in that book? Yes. Mm, you must be very proud of them. Yes. Thank you very much, Federico. We won't keep you up any longer. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Oh, and no worry, because really there is no threat about communism here in Cuba. Well done. When Fidel flies to Washington on April 15, 1959, the opinion is conquered. Fidel tries to be clever on TVs, which detected the good guest and who will always be at his heels. He plays the game, and he's tuned with what everybody wants to hear. I know you are worried. First of all, if we are communists, and of course, I have said very clear that we are not communists. Very clear. In the end, what's behind the mind of a descendant of Spanish colonists expelled from Cuba by America 58 years earlier? What a revenge over history when his children of America give him a party dressed in Barbudo. What a jubilation when he poses in the green uniform of the revolution in front of Lincoln's grave. During this hide-and-seek game, where everybody pretends, President Eisenhower, who mistrusts him, will refuse to meet him. But Nixon will meet him, and though Nixon plays the game for the press, in fact, he is not sincere. Fidel prohibió a, a los dos secretarios que lo acompañaban 
Fidel forbid the two secretaries who accompanied him to the Department of Trade and Economy, together with their American counterparts, to talk about finance. On his return flight, Fidel gloats over the trick he has just played to Uncle Sam when he learns that the Che gave a strict Marxist speech while he was away. To adjust his position, he then declares, the revolution is not red, it is as green as palm trees. And then very quickly, he gathers the Che and Raoul, who criticize him for his exaggerated carefulness. Fidel tells them that he really wants to make a revolution, but that their tactic is bad. Because if they precipitate their confrontation against Cuban Democrats and the USA, they risk losing their power. Follow the pro-communist line of Raul and the Che? How can you believe that I'm capable of such madness? Fidel told me this. I replied, but the people is beginning to suspect us. And he said, the people may suspect us, but I'm the leader of the revolution and I will never support such bullshit. Camilo was laughing. No, it's not a communist revolution. This revolution is even more Cuban than we are. As we were walking, we chanted, Fidelism, yes, communism, no. And Camilo was singing with us. A short while after his return from America, Castro launches the land reform. He gets appointed president of the institution which supervises the expropriation of Americans and Cubans. An expected reform which first gives Castro a real popular support important for the upcoming events. The first bombs explode soon after in Havana. In response, the repression then rises to some degree. Castro includes to the new constitution the death penalty for crimes qualified as counter-revolutionary. On June 11, Fidel invites me to the palace to take part in talks and calm me down. And then, in the course of the discussion, I hear Raoul saying that we must have a St. Bartholomew's night massacre to establish the revolution. I criticize his point of view, but I notice that Fidel doesn't say anything. So I ask that we write down on paper the goals and the management of the revolution. Fidel replies to me, we will have a meeting before the end of the month to settle all of that. In theory, Fidel must maintain a fair balance between the Democrats, the non-communist revolutionaries and the communist revolutionaries. But the Democrats are in the line of fire. They are kept away from decisions since the shadow government found its place and sent away the official government to an onlooker's role in a story which takes place somewhere else. All the secretaries of the official government had a usual officer to who they communicated copies of each document and meeting reports. And one of them who was in service under the presidency of Arutia is still alive. She was a member of the Communist Party. We infiltrated her in Arutia's office and every day she informed us of what was going on. The ministers who trusted me told me, I must talk to you about a serious matter. Do you know what is going on within the cabinet? So we meet up, Fidel talks during three or four hours, we do not discuss the projects, and then we discover the enacted laws in the official review the following day. Which decisions were taken by the shadow government? All of them. The nationalization of banks, of American firms, the change to socialist economy, the land reform, the urban reform. Urrutia was putting a constant break, but after a while, he couldn't do anything. On June 8, 1959, Matos gives a speech in the presence of Urrutia in Camagüey. He insists on the democratic nature of the revolution and promises to resist the communists. This is when Rutia told me, Commander, I suggested to the Castros a 30 days notice to settle the details of my resignation, but they refused. Virtually, I'm now a prisoner of the revolution. I'm a hostage of the Castro brothers. A few days later, Matos, disgusted, resigns as well. 
You cannot resign like this, Fidel told me. We need you. There are commanders who prove being brave fighters. They were useful over there, but now they don't serve in anything. You're different. You were useful over there and you're still useful here. We need your political prudence. So he was putting pressure on me and I replied, all right then. I will give myself more time, but if it starts again, I swear that I will resign and that day you won't count on me anymore. A sensational turn of events occurs against all expectations. Castro resigns. He says that Urrutia prevents him from governing. From hostage of the Castro brothers, Urrutia becomes the nuisance. And Castro becomes the victim. Camilo nos pide por la radio Camillo tells us on the radio that it's necessary that our Prime Minister cancels his resignation. Then he calls to a general strike on TV and on the radio. The country had to make a stop from 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. on that same day. A 10 y 30 de la mañana. Camillo, whose popularity became huge, enters Havana on horseback, followed by thousands of cane cutters who he went fetching in the Sierra to precipitate the course of events. There were militias everywhere, stopping traffic and stopping engines from running. It was a general strike. And 30 minutes later, everything went back to normal. Fidel Castro had taken his responsibility back as Prime Minister. The stratagem worked well. Two days after the putsch, Dorticus, a communist here on Castro's side, succeeds to Arutia. At their feet, the crowd of cane cutters coming from everywhere is the actual power. The crowd governs. In the name of the crowd, there are imprisonments, and the infidels of the revolution are sent to executioners. The crowd reigns, but Castro pulls the strings. Si continuaban las campañas, diciendo que los campesinos no la querían, Íbamos a reunir medio millón de campesinos con sus machetes en la capital de la República. Six millions of machetes protect you, say the banners. A populist leader was just born. All the more dangerous because he allies with the communists, who are the only ones capable of providing the managers he needs. Behind the thousands of machetes waving overhead, who can then suspect that Fidel, backed up by Raul, is placing his pawns? Fidel changed his bodyguards little by little. He replaced the members of the rebel army for his security by other people that we didn't know. We didn't even know where they came from. So they told me, no, you cannot go through. It is forbidden to go over there where the commander is. So we wondered who were these people who refused us the access. There was a conflict between Fidel's security and us. This is when I realized he was changing. Raul, who hates Camillo since the beginning, hates him even more since Camillo made his brother a king. He gets from Fidel the withdrawal of Camillo from the management of armed forces and is appointed instead of him. In October, a new defeat for the Democrats. The M26 is dissolved. The time is now ripe for the revolution to devour its followers. First on the list, Medos. He's just resigned for the second time. Castro is infuriated. Using as a pretext an act of treachery and insurrection, he sends Camillo and his men in Mato's hideout in Camagüey. I told him, Camillo, do you know that you were sent away for my men to kill you? He replied, no, I never thought that. 
I said, but of course it's a trap. My men were provoked for hours. We called them every name, rascals, sons of bitches, traitors, everything. The officers, all the units run by them, were disgraced. They were ready to shoot on the first one who would come to arrest me. I had to send an order to unit leaders and prevent them from using their weapons and even avoid any slander. Pay attention, I told him, because the Castro brothers want to get rid of you. So he had a talk with Camillo on the phone, and Camillo tells him in front of me, Fidel, we made a mistake, there's no treachery, no sedition, everything's in order and the people are disgraced by the accusations, we made a mistake. We must treat this case differently. Fidel insulted him, then he hung up on him. On the day of my arrest, I was sitting there, in the presence of Camillo, and Fidel had also arrived in the neighborhood. So he goes to the balcony which looked upon a square, where there were approximately 4,000 people. And he says that I'm in favor of Trujillo, the dictator of the Dominican Republic, that I'm an ambitious traitor, a scoundrel. He was saying, he's here very next to me, and he listens without even moving. He doesn't even want to take the microphone to defend himself. I suddenly get up and I say, I will answer and I want to. So Camillo looks at me fearfully, because he knows it's a delicate situation. And Romero Valdez prepares his gun as if he was going to kill me. And I said, Camillo, tell Fidel that I want and I must go to the microphone to defend myself. And Camillo makes a gesture with his hand towards me as if he was saying, Uber, where do you think you're going? Insults slanders, physical threats and then prison, everything is done so that Matos will commit suicide. But because it doesn't work that way, they consider murdering him. But since Matos sends a letter to the press where he announces that he will never commit suicide, the plan is abandoned. There remains the option of his confession in Stalinist version. This is when a colonel enters his cell. What I was told by a Roganus, who talked in the name of Fidel, is that if I accepted everything which was said about me, and I calmly went back home without protesting on anything, then I would be free. Which meant no war trial, no execution, nothing. I replied to him, tell Fidel, that after the lies and slanders he directed at me, he will have to execute me a hundred times before buying my silence. Because dignity is the most important thing in life for me. Camillo tries to avoid a public trial since he doesn't want to settle the matter between Castro and Mados. He sends two messages to Mados offering to organize his escape, but Matos refuses. I then realized that Camillo was undergoing the pressure of both Castro brothers to force me to blame him during trial. After a while, I concluded that Camillo wanted to tell me that he was getting me out, but also that he was going to escape with me. Camillo will not help Matos to evade trial, because soon after he will die, or rather he will disappear in a plane crash, no witness and no trace. Facing the cameras, Castro seems grief-stricken. After the event, nobody can imagine that it was something else than an accident, but after a time, the official version will not hold out. Camilo Cienfuegos was a very popular man in Cuba. In Cuba there were two great personalities. Fidel was high up there, like God, and Camilo was below, like the Christ. And Camilo followed Marti's line. He wasn't a communist and he wasn't in favor of a communist revolution. Camillo's column was sent to Santo Domingo and completely disappeared. The only survivor was a young soldier called Ochoa, the famous general. Camillo dead and his men scattered away, Matos in prison, but Fidel still has a considerable problem, the trial of Hubert Matos charged with sedition and treachery. 
Whether I was a traitor or not, since my childhood, I have been faithful to my country. In this revolution, I was among the first revolutionaries who were the most faithful ones. If I'm taken this far, it's precisely because I'm faithful to my country and to the revolution. In front of a thousand officers gathered for the example, Matos defends himself ferociously, and he ends up being applauded. Aware of the danger, Fidel then adjourns the trial to regain control. At the cabinet meeting, he even asks for the support of Democrats to execute Matos. Faustino Perez interrupts him when he mentions that and tells him, what is this, is it Batista's version of terror? So it was brave on behalf of Faustino. But Fidel was flabbergasted and said, no, it's the revolutionary terror. So he runs towards me and throws at me, and you, do you think that Matos is a traitor? I say, no, I don't. So he tells me, so you mean that I'm a liar? Castro is surprised, and he turns towards the Che. The Che warily answers, if we must execute Matos for treachery, then we must execute all the people present here. Castro is amazed. He feels that he can no longer count on his best friends. He then goes up to the front line. Fidel and Raul actually appear before the court and it was a real fight. I reacted to all their accusations and I even accused them of saying lies. So they thought that if they sentenced me to 20 years of jail, I will certainly die in my cell. Matus is sentenced to 20 years and he will spend exactly 20 years in jail. By the end of 1959, Castro is only left with Raul and the Che, the others, all the ones who at a moment or another have personified a democratic tendency, have been eliminated. They were all misled about him and they paid for their mistake with their life. Therefore, who is Fidel Castro? He's a communist because he thought that in Cuba one could not establish a right-wing dictatorship in Batista's manner and because he also thought that a communist dictatorship was an absolute dictatorship. Fidel Castro was an amateur of Machiavelli, and he wanted to be a big one. He succeeded, by the way, through evil, but he succeeded still, so in order to be a big one, he had to challenge the United States, and in order to challenge the United States, he needed the Soviet support, as he also needed that support to keep himself in power. This is what urged him to act this way, more than on behalf of his communist belief. In Frankie's report, we can read everything that will follow. February 6, 1960, visit of the Soviet Secretary of Foreign Affairs in Cuba. Mikoyan declares the Soviet people does not want to export the revolution, but May 1st, 1960, Fidel declares in public, what's the use of elections? December 1st, 1960, Fidel in public, I've always been a communist. December 2nd, 1961, Fidel in public, I'm a Marxist-Leninist and I will stay Marxist-Leninist until the rest of my days. January 1962, Fidel announces in public, 